بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فان خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار today uh, before or at Salat al-Maghrib, we completed the uh, days of At-Tashriq that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said about them that they are days of eating, drinking, and making the dhikr as well. So now the Eid of uh, Al-Adha is done. Anyone who wants to begin to fast starting tomorrow, bidhan Allah is permissible for him to fast whether it's from his nawafil fast or the fast that he has to make up, whatever the case may be. But the days of a tashriq after the Eid, which was Saturday, they are three days. After Saturday, they are Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. So at the end or the beginning of Maghrib today, the issue is complete. Some people were of the opinion that the days of tashriq were the day of the Eid, the next day, and the next day. It's not the case. The Eid is a day by itself, and then the next day is called Yom Al Qir or Al Qar, the day of staying in Mina, and those are the three days of a Tashriq, where the companions used to cut the meat up in slices and let it dry out, so that they can bring it back to Medina and that they can use the meat over there. Another important issue, although the days of Eid are gone, but it was something that we saw even in the Masajid of Alul Hadith, is that after the prayers from the Fajr of the day of Arafat, people started saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, and so forth and so on, after the prayers. We have mentioned uh, prior to that, that from the Ahkam and the etiquette of Al Eid, is that this dhikr should have been made all day, every day, at any time. It is a fact that Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he mentioned that it is highly recommended, along with other scholars, that you do it after the prayer. But there's no delil for that taqsis, for a person to say after the prayer. There's no delil for that. So it should be left open, because that's how the Prophet wasallam left it. He said it was those days where you should be making the dhikr and that's what the companions used to do walking down the street coming into the house going out of the house sitting in the house going to the masjid before the prayer after the prayer it's not just after the prayer but we say Allah minna wa minkum whatever the case may be may Allah accept it from us and from you as well I want to remind you as well that we're still in the sacred and blessed month of Lul Hijjah so this is still a month that is sacred. Although the best 10 days of the month of the year, they have passed, they're behind us. Nonetheless, the month of Dhul Hijjah is a month that the Muslim has to pay attention to, just as he would pay attention to being in the masjid. This is a special place. He's going to pay attention to being in Mecca and Medina, Beit al-Maqdas, because it's a special place. So... We should keep in mind that our level of taqwa and consciousness should be heightened during this month. Because the day's over doesn't mean that it's party time. Anyway, we're going to deal with two important chapters uh, from Kitab al-Tawheed, inshallah, to resume the book. And the first chapter is what is said about astronomy or astrology. Astronomy slash astrology. And in Arabic it is a tanjim, a tanjim. The Imam brings the hadith that's in Sahih al Bukhari that uh, the, the, the Tabi'i Qatada, may Allah Ta'ala have rahmah upon Qatada from the ulama of the Tabi'in, Qatada said, 
not the Prophet but Abu Bakr, Uthman, Ali radiallahu anhum the scholar from the Tabi'in Qatada he said Allah created the stars for three things he created them for decorating the heavens and he created them for stoning the shayateen and he also created them for signs that the people can navigate by those stars he said anyone who interprets the stars other than this what was mentioned then he is mistaken and he has missed his share and his portion and he has talked about that which he has no knowledge so that clearly shows that Al Imam Qatada who went over the Quran with Abdullah ibn Abbas 17 times 1-7 he said I sat with Ibn Abbas and he went over the Quran 17 times with me every single ayat he would tell me where it was revealed and what it meant and some knowledge about it so therefore the great scholar Sufyan al-Thawri the Amir al-Mu'minin in al-Hadith had his own madhab he said if the tafsir of the Quran comes to you from Qatada then take it then take it because if Abdullah ibn Abbas was the companion that stood above the other companions in terms of the tafsir of the Quran because the Prophet hugged him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and made a dua Allahumma allimhu ta'wil al-Quran teach him your book and that's what happened he was young but he knew the Quran better than everybody else because of the dua of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and therefore Umar radiallahu anhu used to allow him to sit amongst the shayukh of the companions and some of them complained and said why is this young man sitting with us at the death of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Ibn Abbas how old are you? 17 can you stand up for me? can you stand up real quick? don't be shy Abdullah ibn Abbas at the death of Rasulullah sallallahu was the age of this boy and then you have Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Abdurrahman, Ibn Auf, and those red other companions, 60 years old, 65 years old. They were older people. Ibn Abbas was like this boy. So he used to allow him to sit with those shiuch. And some of the people said, why is it that he can sit here? We have children his age and we don't let our children come. Why is it that he can sit here? Umar radiallahu anhu said, you people tell me, what is the meaning of the statement? And he read that surah. They told him their interpretation of the surah. He said, what do you have to say about that surah? Ya Abdullah ibn Abbas. Abdullah ibn Abbas said, this surah was revealed to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If that victory comes and the help of Allah comes and people come into the religion in droves, it was Allah's way of telling Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, your mission is complete and you're about to die pretty soon. No one else saw that from those people. Abdullah ibn Abbas understood it. Umar understood it. Doing his khilafah, he understood it. So he said, that's why the boy is there. So the point here is, if Ibn Abbas was of that level, Qatada took from Ibn Abbas, then you can rest assured that Qatada, rahimullah, wasn't a lightweight. So he mentioned about the stars. He said that the stars have been created for three reasons, only not for astronomy and not for astrology where people try to figure out the unseen based upon the stars and based upon the movement, especially of the moon. That is really what is called a tanjim, where people look at the moon. The moon has a cycle that it goes through. 28 days, it keeps moving, and it has a different cycle. That knowledge is called a tasgir. We're going to come to that, inshallah. But Qatada wanted to make it clear that this is from the affairs of a jahiliya. The Muslim can't tell what's going to happen based upon the positioning of the stars. The moon, whether it's half moon, full moon, has no effect and impact upon the behavior of a people, turning to a werewolf and murdering people in the 15th of the month and so forth. That's khurafat. You go to the court of law in this country or in America, for an example, and you stand before the judge and they say, why did you murder that man? He said, I murdered him because it was the 15th of the month, full moon, and I was crazy. They're going to say, you're going to jail. We're going to execute you. Same thing in our deen. Same thing in our deen. People can't say and believe in that nonsense. 
Why did he mention that the stars are for those three reasons? He mentioned them because of what was mentioned in the book of Allah Ta'ala. وَلَقَدْ زَيَّنَّ السَّمَاءَ الدُّنْيَا بِمَسَابِحِ In Surah Al-Mulk, Allah said, Verily, we have beautified the heavens with stars. مَسَابِحِ وَجَعْلْنَاهَا رَجُومٍ لِلشَّيَاطِينَ And we made those stars meteors against the shayateen, missiles. So in Surah Al-Mulk, Two reasons come to us. Number one, Allah beautify the stars. Because we have lights around us, we don't get an appreciation for the beauty of the constellation. Because all of these lights, they dim out the stars. But I'm sure you people have been in places, rural areas, where you look at the star and into the sky, and you see the magnificence of how Allah Azza put that stuff together. And the human beings only know a fraction about what's going on out there. So anyway... The sun, the moon, all of that is for the beautification of the sky, the heavens. So that mankind will reflect and say, La ilaha illallah. He establishes the tawheed. Not, a go, not go against the tawheed of Allah by believing in craziness about it. Second thing is that the stars have been made meteors for missiles, for the shayateen. Anytime a shaitan goes and he tries to steal a hearing from the heavens, Anytime they do something that they're not supposed to be doing up in the sama, after the revelation of the Quran, those shooting stars come and they burn them up and they destroy them. And number three, finally, Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, Allah is the one who made for you people the stars so that you can be guided in the darkness of the night on sea as well as on the land so the Arabs especially they were prolific when it came to traveling across the desert and they used the stars to do that the Arabs they were the people who were on the seven seas and they were able to travel all over the place using those constellations and the non-Muslims came and I don't say that they stole, but they borrowed from the knowledge of the Arabs and they made those maps and compasses and other than that. So that knowledge was as a result of knowing where the North Star is, knowing where all of those other constellations. So Qatada said, these are the three things that the stars are for. He went on to mention, he said, anyone who says anything other than that, then that individual, he missed the point and he's talking about something he has no knowledge about. We'll explain that inshallah. The next point the Imam brought was that Qatada disliked learning about the moon's orbit. Qatada, he didn't like for anyone to learn about astronomy or astrology or what I said was called a tasyir, the knowledge of a tasyir. Ibn Uyayna, he did not make a concession for it. And Harb mentioned this from them or about them. And Al Imam Ahmed and Ishaq, they made exceptions for it. So, for those of you who have the book, he just mentioned the first names of some of these ulama. I just want to very quickly say Ibn Uyayna, that's Al Imam Sufyan Ibn Uyayna, who was a big scholar in Mecca, taught Al Imam al Shafi. He's one of the two Sufyans. So, sometimes you have to be aware of this man and Sufyan al Thawri, who was bigger than him. Sometimes the book would just say, Sufyan said. So which Sufyan is it? Ibn Uyayna or Sufyan al thawri So they're the two Sufyan. This one is Sufyan ibn Uyayna. The other one is Harb. Harb is uh, Harb al-Kirmani. He was from the uh, companions of Ali Imam Ahmed, from the major students of Al Imam Ahmed, Harb ibn Ismail al-Kirmani. They did not give any permission for people to learn about this stuff concerning the stars. He mentioned but Ahmed and Ishaq. Ahmed is Al Imam Ahmed, Ahmed ibn Hanbal, Ahmed ibn Muhammad ibn Hanbal, and Ishaq is Ishaq Rahuya. Ishaq Rahawi had his own madhab, and his madhab was bigger and better than the four madhabs that we know about right now. He was before Al Imam Ahmed, his madhab was bigger and better than the four madhabs that we have right now. 
but he didn't allow the people to take care of his words like that because he didn't want people to blindly follow him. He didn't want to be responsible for that. So this goes to show that this issue has some ikhtilaf in it. Qatada, Sufyan ibn Uyayna, they said there are no exceptions, no concessions. Don't learn about the orbit of the moon. The ilmul tasyir. Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, وَالْقَمَرْ قَدَّرْنَاهُ مَنَازِرًا we made the moon and we gave it its phases, its orbit. وَالشَّمْسُ تَجْرِي لِمُسْتَقَرٌ لَهَا ذَلِكَ تَقْدِيرُ الْعَزِيزِ الْعَلِيمُ The sun, we made it so that it does what it does. وَالْقَمَرْ قَدَّرْنَاهُ مَنَازِرًا حَتَّ عَادَكَ الْعُرْجُونَ الْقَدِيمُ We made the moon so that it goes into its phases or its orbits. It goes around and then it comes like the... Uh, old stalk of the date tree. It starts like this on the right side, the hilal, and then it gets bigger, 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 half moon, full moon, and it starts to shrink from the other side, and then it comes back again. That is the manazil, or the phases of the moon. 28 phases. So the people used to look at those phases, and they say, after seven nights, eight nights, this will happen, that will happen, this means this, and this means that. So somebody, in order to know about for an example, where's the Qibla? You're learning st astrology in order to know about the tawqeet of the salah. When is the prayer? You're learning the astrology in the ilm tasir in order to know about the seasons. When is it going to rain? Bi'idhnillah. Things like that. You're learning about this stuff to know when there's going to be a drought. And things like that. There's no problem. If you do it for that reason, it's no problem. But if you do it in order to do guesswork and to be a person with superstition and things like that, then that goes against the Tawheed and that's why the Imam brought it in this particular chapter. He mentioned the hadith of Abu Musa and Ash'ari. He said that the Prophet wasallam said, three, will not, three people will not enter into the paradise. Three people won't go into the paradise. Al-Jannata. Three people won't go into the paradise. The person who is addicted to khamr and the one who cuts the ties of relationships and the one who believes in magic. So this goes to show that these three things are major sins. The one who is addicted to khamr, the one who cuts off the tie of relationship, and the one who he believes in magic. This doesn't mean that the person will never ever go to the hell, to the Jannah. This is a hadith, a nafs of al waid It's a threat. If a person dies on one of these three and he dies on Tawheed, he may go to the hellfire and get punished and he may come out. It's up to Allah to just to punish him or not. But it's saying to frighten the people and it could be the punishment. So we don't make takfir of a person and say you're kafir because he's addicted to drugs. He's addicted to alcohol. It's a major sin, no doubt. And if a person dies with alcohol in his stomach, he dies like the one who worships the idols, the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But if a person is an alcoholic, but he makes toba and things like that, and he asks Allah to forgive him, and if he dies with that, Allah is ghafur rahim. قُلْ يَا إِبَادِ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَى أَنفُسِهِمْ لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله إن الله يغفر الذنوب جميعا. Tell them, Ya Muhammad, O my servants who have gone overboard and sinned against yourselves, don't give up hope. Don't despair from the rahmah of Allah. Allah will forgive every sin. So this is a, a, a nas of al waid. It's a threat. Second thing is the person who cuts off the tie of relationship. Cutting off the tie of relationship, Ikhwani, is something common in our community. Cutting off the tie of relationship is when you have problems between you and another blood relative, especially the close ones, and you help to accommodate the problem. You help to accommodate it. They say, Ya Rasulullah, who is the person who really connects? Who is the one who really connects? He said, the one who really connects is the one who he tries to connect, and they cut him off, but he continues to try. They don't want to connect, but he continues to try. And the reason why he continues is for many reasons. It's a major sin to be the one who's responsible for cutting off the time relationship. Also, another re reason is because if they cut you off and you're trying to do right, 
the statement of Allah Ta'ala, Ya ayyul ladina amanu alaykum in fusukum. La yadurrukum man dalla that daytum. Oh, you believe. You're responsible for your own self. You're responsible for yourself. It doesn't hurt you. It doesn't bother you. Those who go astray, if you are guided aright. So you're not responsible for what they do. You're responsible for yourself. Third thing, Ikhwani, and this is extremely important. This person doesn't want to connect you from your relatives. And Allah told you, connect with them. Connect to them. And they don't accommodate. But if a person does it anyway, because Allah said it, because the Prophet threatened Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Then it's a sign of Al-Ihsan Al-Ihsan Jibril said Ya Muhammad What is Al-Ihsan? He said An ta'budu Allah Ka'annaka tarahu Wa in lam takun tarahu Fa innu yaraq That you worship Allah As though Allah Like you see Allah And although you don't see Allah You know that Allah sees you So you only do it And you say Allah Wallahi I see these people They don't like me And it's not nice What they're doing But I'm going to be set I'm going to have sabr I'll keep doing it Because you told me and then the person can make a tawassu. He says, oh Allah, because you know that I keep connecting with them, I keep, and they're doing this against me, then I ask you to give me this, give me the job, give me that, give me this, say this, say that. So he can make a tawassu with those efforts. The third one is the one who believes in magic. What's the connection between that hadith and the chapter of astrology, astronomy? The reason is, Astrology and astronomy is a part of magic. It's a type of magic. There are different types of magic. There is the magic of the bayan. In the bayan, le sihra. Verily, certain speech is magic, the Prophet said. There's the magic of a tiwala, love potions that people put on people. The Prophet said that the one who breaks the relationship between people, he is a magician. He said, he called it al-abda. That is the ability that someone goes and he makes the mother hate her son. Which it goes against the fitrah. The mother's going to love her son. The mother's going to love her daughter. But someone has the ability to put magic with their fitna. And then you have the black magic, you have the white magic, you have all these types of magic. One of the magics is that najum. He says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, man iqtabasa. Shorbatan min al najum, faqad iktabasa, shorbatan min al sihr, zada mazad. Anyone who learns a branch or a portion of astronomy, astrology, he has learned a portion of magic. Let him increase as much as he wants. Let him do as much as he wants. So that's the connection of the hadith and this chapter. That three people won't go into the Jannah, and one of them is the one who is a practitioner of. A sihr in any shape, form, or fashion. So that's the first chapter. The chapter is comprehensive. It's not heavy, it's not deep, it's simple, it's easy. So the Muslim, he doesn't believe in astronomy or astrology in any way except what is legislated. Though some scholars said all of it is not permissible. Other scholars said no, some of it is permissible, and that's the haq, inshallah, to learn where the qibla is to learn about the salawat, what time it comes, the seasons, to learn these things that help the person in his religion, that type of astronomy, astrology is permissible. As for Pisces, Libra, Sagittarius, Scorpion, Capricorn, all of that stuff is khurafat. All of that stuff is khurafat. Next chapter, hey, Juan, uh, that last hadith that we mentioned, in this book that I have, I don't know, those of you who have the English book, the last hadith that I mentioned, the last hadith that I mentioned, the hadith of Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, did they give the ruling of that hadith in your book? What did he say? So this person who took care of this book and he translated he said that this hadith is weak because all of the chains of narration go through a man by the name of, what's his name? Abu what? Al-Azdi? Abu Harir. Abu Harir Al-Azdi. He's weak. And he wrote in your book that it's weak, it's weak. 
And he said, look over here what Al Albani said is weak. But Al Albani mentioned in another book that is called a Targheeb. Targheeb. A Targheeb or Targheeb. And he said that the, authentic, the book, the, the hadith is authentic. So we have two rulings by Al Albani. One that this person relied upon, and the other one he didn't rely upon. So one book said it's authentic, and the other one said it's weak. The correct ruling on this hadith is that it is authentic. So you make that note in your book. This hadith, it is sahih. This hadith is authentic. Huh? It said it's authentic. So those of you who have the book that is great, great in this hadith is da'if, you make a note. This hadith is authentic. We don't have the time to get into the reality of this issue. Al Albani said the hadith is sahih over here and weak over here, and it's the same hadith. How do we look at that? You have some people who are the enemies of the ulama of al Salafiya, the ulama of al Hadith, the enemies. They're the blind followers, they're the people of innovation. So they say, You see, Al Albani didn't know what he was doing. So the man spent time and money, and he wrote a book called. The clear contradictions of Al Albani. And that guy sat down and went through Al Albani's books and he showed, he ruled this here, he ruled that there, and he was just trying to take away from the credibility of the Sheikh. We say, if a person were to do that with sincerity and he wanted to go through Sheikh al Islam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab's books and show how he was in hadith, which people have done then he would have helped the ummah he would have given nasiha to the ummah ad-dinu nasiha he would have advised the ummah and he would have helped great scholar's name is an imam al-darqutni he came after al-imam al-bukhari al-imam muslim they have the two most authentic books of hadith in the dunya he came and he went through those two books and he did just that he did just that he got some right but most of the time bukhari and muslim were correct but he had sincerity inshallah so his book is a classical work that we rely upon. Second of all, Ikhwani, and Al-Bani is not Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's not Prophet Muhammad. We follow the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We don't care who the scholar is. We're going to have respect for all of the ulama. But the ulama who we love, we're not going to be for those people, from those people who when a scholar we love, he makes a mistake. We're going to accept that mistake. Lastly, lastly, every scholar said this, and then he changed his position. Every scholar, even you people sitting there, you said this, and then you change your position. You used to say this, then you found out it wasn't like that. I prayed next to one of our young brothers when we were praying. He was making sure to put his foot on my heel. He was making sure through the whole prayer. I like barak fihi. He wanted to establish the sunnah. When it's time for the tashahad, he had his fingers on his knees and he had this one up. After the salat, I told him, do like this with your finger and point like that, and it'd be the sunnah. Now the boy is going to do that. He said, he said, like this or like that? I said, what you want to do? It's okay, whatever you want. This one, that one, so that. Now the boy is going to pray like that. He'll go back, inshallah, look for that sunnah. So he was doing one thing at a time. He didn't know. He thought it was like that, and then he changed it. He was, That's normal. It's normal. Imam Shafi, those of our brothers from Somalia, and the Shafi in Medhat, Every Somali who knows that madhab knows an Imam al Shafi had a madhab that they called the Qadim, the old one, and the Jadid, the new one. When he changed his position, changed his position. So don't be one of those people who are in the military camp and you have to stay like that, my Sheikh said, my madhab said. And then you push him like that and he can't move. No, the Muslim is going to be like this. He's going to say, okay, relax, it's okay. I changed my position. I'm not on that position anymore. So that hadith is authentic from the Nabi. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. The next chapter, Khwani, is the chapter of what is said about seeking rain by the anwa. Al istisqa bil anwa. Seeking rain. In Al Islam, we seek rain with salat al istisqa. We make a particular prayer asking Allah. To make it rain when there's a drought and when there's a need. We don't go to any human being and say, make it rain. The Indians in America, they call them the Native Americans, the people who the Europeans went to America and then stole their land and killed them off. And right now they live on reservations. But they had shirk in what they believe. 
they have a rain dance. And the popular Hollywood movies when I was growing up used to always show this. They would be dancing around the fire and they would be calling on the ancestors to make it rain. That stuff is not permissible in our deen. We ask for the rain from Allah Azzawajal. And that's why this is in this chapter. Al-Istisqa. Asking it to rain. Asking for rain through the stars. Through the constellation. It goes against a tawheed. One of the types of tawheed is the tawheed of Allah's rububiyyah. He is the Lord of everything. He makes it rain. He provides. He does everything for you alone. And no one else helps him in those things. So the person who, the person who, he goes to the doctor and he thinks the doctor is making him well, something's wrong with his tawheed. He thinks the medicine that the doctor is giving is making him well, something against his tawheed. Something is against his tawheed. And that's what we dealt with in this class, previous class before, the hadith, la adwa, that there is no contagious disease. There is no contagious disease. You cannot be contaminated with Ebola. Right now there's a problem. May Allah protect us from Ebola. They didn't allow some Muslims to come to Hajj because of Ebola. Look how easy it is for the Beni Adam to be wiped out. Someone goes to Hajj and he has Ebola. He comes to the UK, khalas, if Allah wanted to wipe everybody out, easily, easily. And they can't do anything about it. Can't do anything about it. And we, that's just an example because Allah can just cause the sky to fall on the people, cause the earth to open up, just stop your heart from beating. I'm just saying, we are weak people. We're weak creation. So there's no contagious disease. What's the meaning of that? How can there be a hadith that says no contagious disease when we have other hadith that say, run away, the per run away from the person with leprosy. Don't go by him. Go the other way. Companions were traveling and they were going to go into that area. They heard there was a contagious disease in that area. Uh, some of the companions said, let's go. Have to work on Allah. Uh, Umar said, I'm not going in there. I'm not going in there. We're going the other, other way. They said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, are you running away from the Qadr of Allah? If it was meant for you to get, you going to get. He said, no, I'm not running away from the Qadr of Allah. I'm running away from this. I'm running away from this to the Qadr of Allah. So we have those hadith telling us, tie your camel. Don't let the camel that is with good health drink the water with the same water, the camel with bad health. So the meaning that there is no contagious disease, Ebola can't harm you, hepatitis can't harm you, these diseases that one person carries, the flu can't harm you. The meaning of that is that the flu by itself can't harm you. Ebola can't harm you. It may be actually somebody sitting here right now with Ebola. We all may have Ebola. We all may have Ebola. But Allah didn't let it happen. That's from the Rububiya of Allah, his Tawheed. So the Imam, he brings a number of issues like the ayat of the Quran. You people, the risk that I gave you, the ni'mah that I gave you, instead of appreciating it, you deny and you reject. So Allah gives you rain. And instead of you praising Allah, you attribute the rain to someone else or something else. That's the meaning of the ayat. That's why he brought that ayat. Then he brought the statement in Sahih Muslim that Abu Malik and Ash'ari said that the Prophet Wasallam said, there are four matters from the times of Jahiliyyah. The people of Jahiliyyah used to do these four things and my ummah will continue to do these four things and they will never leave these four things of Jahiliyyah. And he went on to mention them that the first one was Al-Fakhr Bil Ansab Being proud of your ancestry Al-Ta'an Fil Aba Talking bad about other people's fathers and their lineage al istisqa bil anwa and seeking the rain through the stars and al niyaha al niyaha al al mate and wailing over the dead person wailing over the dead person he mentioned in another hadith he the prophet says sallallahu alaihi wasallam about the wailing lady when the wailing woman does not repent before her death she will be raised up yomul qiyama with a coat of tar on her and her skin she will be a leper, Yomul Qiyamah. And that's inside Muslim. 
And the reason why he said the woman here is because the woman, yani, as the scholar said, ghalaba, yani, uh, that's usually the case. That it's the woman who's going to well. Pay attention to that. The prophet said, the woman who wells, if she doesn't make toba before she dies, she'll be raised up and her skin will have tar and she'll be a leper. Yomu Kiyama. And leprosy is not a nice, it's not a nice disease. It's one of the most horrific diseases known to Benny Adam. And that's why they used to have leper colonies. Terrible, drastic disease. And the Imam read some ayat today concerning that. Oh no, he read the ayat about uh, Eunice, Jonah. The woman from her characteristics is if someone dies, she's the one who goes crazy. She's the one who screams, falls on the ground. She's the one who loses her brain. The, he can be sad. He can be overwhelmed with grief, but he's not going to become emotional. Don't be that individual, the man who is like a woman in her behavior. He gets angry and he loses his I mean, he just loses his, he really goes overboard in how angry he is. The way that Allah created men is that they are more hazm. He's more in control of his emotions. That lady, depending on what time of the month it is, or just her disposition, usually they are a bit more emotional. And they need that inside of them, in their fitrah, to deal with what they have to deal with. And that doesn't mean she's weak, because if the man, if we had to deal with giving birth to a baby, we call time out. We say, hey, I don't want to deal with this because Allah didn't create us for that. So the point here is, the point here is, these four things from them that was mentioned, al-istisqa bi al-anwa, is from what the people of the jahili used to do. In jahiliya, the person would say, your lineage is this and your lineage is that and your lineage is this and you're that and you're that and my lineage is this and mine is that. And the prophet said, this ummah will do this and it never stop. And this is true. Ikhwani is sensitive. I don't mean any disrespect. And I don't want anyone to feel like I'm making a problem here. But in Somalia, that country has been torn apart because of this issue. The problems between Darul and Hawiya to this very day. Our youngsters don't have this problem like the elders. But is this the property of Somali people alone? La wallahi. This is the problem of Pakistani people as well. Racist people. Racist. Some seriously racist Pakistani people. Bangladeshis. Pakistanis are racist amongst themselves and they're racist against Bangladeshis. Bangladeshis are racist within themselves. I came into Islam with some people, Bangladesh, they looked at me like I was some problem. And wallahi, they were darker than me. They were from Bangladesh, darker than me. Amazing. Every Indians, Indians, it's their religion. It's the caste system in India. The caste system. We have a brother, Dawood, became a Muslim. He's from India, Hindi. He's from India. One of the reasons why the relatives of the Indian Muslim can accept them embracing Islam, Sikh, Hindu, is that they look at Muslims as a lesser group of people. So everyone in this ummah has this. You go to the Arab world, in the Gulf, the racist people in the world, along with Pakistanis, along with everybody. Amongst themselves, amongst themselves, in the Gulf states, some tribes see themselves as being better than others. They have electricity over there, two currents, 220 and 110. Some of them say, our tribe is 220, yours is 110. And they make big problems with this stuff. And those Arabs, who his tribe is 110, he feels he's better than the Egyptian. He feels that he's better than the Moroccan and the Algerian. And the Algerians and Moroccans. This one is a Berber and that one is not a Berber. The Prophet spoke the truth, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Four issues from my ummah from the times of Jahiliyyah, the people from my ummah will never ever let it go. And wallahi, every Eid, every Eid, if a person talked about this topic in the khutbah, he would have done a good job. Because our community is a racist. And racism is for the ignorant person. For the ignorant, it goes against Tawheed. Allah is the creator. 
of every shape and form in this place. And that's why when one of the companions says something about another companion because of his color, he was an Arab and that man was from Ethiopia, Bilal was from Ethiopia and he was dark and he called him the son of a black woman. When the Prophet heard about that, he said to that man, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said to him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Atta'iruhu bi ummihi inna kamri unfika jahiliya. Do you criticize him and put him down because of his mother? This is not his fault. I can't even use that word, his fault. This is not his choice. Do you criticize him because of his mother? His mother gave birth to him. He didn't have anything to do with that. He said, verily, you a person that has jahiliya in you. So for those brothers who are reverts, don't allow any of these people to come to you to make you feel like you're a second-class citizen. And that's one of the reasons why I personally rejected Christianity. Because it's institutionalized racism. Isa, the son of Allah, according to the pictures that they give, is a white man, blue eyes and blonde hair. And all of the prophets and messengers, even the angels, are white people. So if you grow up, grow up looking at that white, 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 you're going to have an inferiority complex. White is good and black is bad. And that's what we have in our culture. Things that we don't even appreciate. They used to tell us if you're black, step back. They used to tell us stuff like that. If you're black, step back. If you're white, you're right. So what are you talking about? The Muslim comes to this religion and he sees that our deen addressed this. The best of you here is the one who has the most taqwa. We made you people, nations and tribes so that you can get to know one another. On the day of the Eid, I went and I had breakfast with some people from West Africa. I saw their culture. I was with them, how they dress, how they are. Some of us, this masjid, Al-Hadith, Asian people started this masjid. We visit these brothers and we, deal, we start to learn each other's culture and we take the good and we leave the bad. It's as simple as that. So the point here, Ikhwani, those four things and from them is Al-Istisqa, asking for the rain. The last hadith that he brings, really, really important hadith and incident, is the incident that Zayd ibn Khalid, radiallahu anhu, he reported that the Prophet sallam, he led the companions in the Salat of Al-Fajr. At the time of Al-Hudaybiyah, the Sulh of Al-Hudaybiyah, a lot happened on that journey, on that trip. This is one of the things that happened. In the journey of Al-Hudaybiyah, they were traveling, and then they woke up for prayer. When they prayed and the Salat was done, the Prophet turned around to the people, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which was his sunnah. Sometimes he would turn around and face them. Sometimes he would turn around and put them to his right, and he would face the people in the right suf. He would do that a lot, showing the virtues of those people and praying on the right side of the imam in the suf al-awwal. And sometimes he would turn to the left, but that was a little bit, showing he's fair to everybody, but try to be on the right side. That's a sunnah that is not practiced today, but he used to do that. Turn around, that's his sunnah. Make the dhikr. But in this case, he turned around and then he taught them, which goes to show the permissibility after a prayer that a person can talk and give a lesson. That's from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. He turned around and he said to the people, do you people know what your Lord has said? You want to know what Allah told me? They said, as they used to always say, Allah and his messenger, they know best. They didn't talk when they didn't have knowledge. Allah and his messenger knows best. Today, unfortunately, our ummah, we're not like that. We don't say Allah and his messenger know best. Every Amr, Bakr, and Zaid is a mufti. Every single person can talk because of the fitness of the internet and social media. We have developed and cultivated a monster amongst the Muslim community. Uh, you go to Hajj now, we have to deal with this issue of the selfies. I'm sure you people have heard about this. The people are in Mecca and they're taking pictures at the Kaaba. And the people are doing all kinds of things, compromising their Hajj. Whoever performs Hajj and he does it correctly, he'll come back like the day his mother gave birth to him. 
Now, if you study and prepare yourself mentally for Hajj and you keep saying that before you go there, I guarantee you, inshallah, you're going to be faced with trials and tribulations where you lose your cool, where you do something where your Hajj can be destroyed. But now this thing with the selfie, the telephone, the way it is, this is an issue that is, subhanAllah, new Islam, new challenges. So one of the problems we have today is if you look at anything on the internet, everyone and anyone is allowed to comment. The person knows nothing about his religion. He wants to make a comment. This is good, this is bad. He doesn't know anything about the deen of Allah. Then study doesn't know. And his ikhlas is even suspect. Because he has a double standard. He's saying something about this thing, but someone he likes does the same thing, or he does the same or worse, but he's saying this comment. So those companions, ikhwani, they would not put their feet in the realm of responsibility until they knew what they were talking about. Do you people know what your Lord said last night? What Allah said? They said Allah and His Messenger knows best. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah said, This morning, when we woke up, this morning, some of my servants from the companions, they have believed in me and others have disbelieved. As for those who have believed in me, it is the one who said, we received the rain last night because of Allah's bounty. That is the believe in me. And the disbeliever in the stars. He believes in me and disbelieves in the stars. As for the one who said, we received rain because of the position of the stars. It was like this and it was like that. So therefore the, the rain came down. He said, that is a disbeliever in me. And he's a believer in the stars. That hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. So the hadith goes to show ikhwani, that a person can fall into kufr, he can make a mistake that is kufr, but he doesn't become a kafir because this happened with some of the companions. It didn't happen with the major companions. It happened with those who are new in Islam. You understand? We have people that we deal with who don't know their religion. So people who are giving dawah should relax. We should relax. Our relatives who are on brilliism and this stuff, you have to relax. His mother's father doesn't know. Relax. Because you, alhamdulillah, are trying to be on the right way. Don't put your nose up in the air at people and you're rough and tough with everybody. The companions made statements. Some of them, radiallahu anhum, the Prophet said that Allah said, that's kufr. So the Prophet didn't wake up and didn't pray with the people and start pointing them out and shaming and naming people like that. Boycotting people like that. The Tao of the Sunnah, it's supposed to bring knowledge to the people and khayr to the people and ease to the people. ISIS, they don't understand ease. Shabab, they don't understand Boko Haram, they don't understand ease in the religion. How in the world is someone in his right mind, in his right mind, going to kill someone who's innocent on the day of their Eid? Later till Eid, who does that? Even the extreme people from Al-Qaeda who don't know ease, even those people are trying to go to ISIS to tell them to calm down. But ISIS is an animal of a different color altogether. Gotta relax. We have to take it easy. So a person can fall into an innovation, but it doesn't make him an innovator because he raises his hands after every prayer. You're going to say he's an innovator? He doesn't know. Take it easy. And another thing is, what he's doing, you may see it as an innovation, but he has some scholar, some point of view that someone took the other side. He may be right, he may be wrong. The point is, we have to take it easy. We have to take it easy. So this incident that happened with the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions, it goes to show that some of them still had the residuals of certain things of a jahiliyyah, things that stick in the person's mind. It's still part of his DNA. So as a result of that, he still does those things because he doesn't know, it's hard to separate himself from that. A person is a racist individual. He's racist for his tribe. He's racist. And the Prophet said that racism is from the affairs of Jahiliyyah. You come and you see his racism and you say, you're Kafir from Jahiliyyah. And that's what ISIS does. They make ta'wil like that. They make ta'wil. They kill Muslims based upon their interpretation. Abu Usama mentioned us in an open farm. He's against raising up the kalim of Allah. If we catch him anywhere, we're going to deal with him. Because he's against Allah and his religion. That's the ta'wil. That's the ta'wil. 
And those of you who don't know Arabic language, you're locked out of the box in being able to see the reality of ISIS on YouTube. They have been exposed for their reality because it's hard to hide in today's time with this YouTube stuff. What they say and what they do and the people who have proper information concerning them, we used to have the ability to say, oh, you don't know, maybe it's not you. you no, it's been proven clearly. So with this particular issue, Khwani, those companions who did that, the Prophet was basically warning them, don't do this thing because this is believing in the stars and disbelieving in Allah. And the one who said it rained because of Allah alone, then he's a believer in Allah and a disbeliever in the stars. Now the position of the stars and the way that the wind went, there's an angel who is called Israfil, Israfil, who the Prophet used to swear by Allah. Allahumma ya Rabb, ya Rabb, Allahumma Rabb Jibreel wa Mikael wa Israfil. Fatir al-Samawati wal He used to say that all the time. Israfil, what, what, what is his job? One of his jobs is he pushes the clouds from here to there and he makes it rain bi It's his job. But he is not the reason or the cause, but he's a wasila. The stars, the wind, the position. It is not the reason, but Allah created those things to be wasail because of Allah first and through through those things after Allah's permission and his, his qadr, these things happen. The doctor, the same way. The medicine, the same way. You yourself, the same way. Everything that we do, as Allah mentioned in the Quran, we created you and the things that you do. So this is the connection of a tawheed in this particular chapter, that it goes against tawheed of the rububi of Allah Azza to believe that the rain came down because of anything or anyone other than Allah the Rabbil Alameen. So if you brothers have any questions, inshallah, we'll take uh, five minutes to deal with the questions about the dars. Fadli ya Good question, Ahi. Good question. There is a sunnah that we should fast the three white days, and those are the three middle days of the month. Does that have something to do with the moon? Does that have something? Why is that? I never looked up that issue. I never looked up that issue. You have my um, my um, telephone number, so send me a text message, inshallah. Send me a text message. You also mentioned Ahi. Um, Sharif, and I will ask class about the hadith. The Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if there was bad luck, it would be in three things. One hadith said, bad luck is in three things. So a person comes across that hadith. Bad luck is in three things. Anybody remember what they were? Anybody remember what they were? He said, bad luck is in the woman, your wife, is in your house, and it's in your car. Now, if you only found that hadith, then you miss you that's it. No, there's another hadith that said, if magic, if bad luck was in something, it would have been in these three things. But there's no bad luck. Everything is by the qadr of Allah. There's no bad luck. You see a white bird, you see a dove, good luck. You see a crow, bad luck. You see a vulture, bad luck. A man with one eye in a patch, bad luck. The number 13, bad luck. No bad luck. That goes against Tohi. The meaning of that. The bad luck in the woman. She doesn't have babies. The bad luck in the woman. She is disobedient. The bad luck in the woman. There's no harmony between her and her husband. The bad luck in the woman. She brings out the worst in him. He brings out the worst in her. They can't coexist. The bad luck in the house. He has bad neighbors. The bad luck in the house. Stuff is always breaking. Bad luck in his house right now, right now. Some of our homes, because you know they ripping us off, the mafia, you know the uh, gas companies and stuff. It's colder in our house than it is outside. It's cold in the house than it is outside. That, um, what's that stuff that affects your breathing? That uh, on the wall. It's in all the houses in the UK. Even if you have a new house, it's under the paint. That's the houses of the UK. What is it called? What? Yeah, but I'm looking for that other word that, and it comes becomes black, mold. In his house, there's mold behind the. He can't see. He he lives in small heath. They mice, mice and rats all over the place. 
Bad luck. That's the meaning of that hadith. And in your car, it's clear. It doesn't start up when he needs it. The brakes don't work that well. His MOT is always failing. It's a problematic car. So, so that was the meaning of that hadith. Okay? So I'll find that out, inshallah. You send me a text message. Akhi. Concerning the people who have the opinion that uh, you can't rely on the weather on TV or on your mobile phone, you can't rely on this stuff, you can't use it because of these hadith. As we mentioned today, there are some scholars who took that position. We told you that. Al Imam Qatada took that position. Sufyan ibn Uyayna took that position. Those are big scholars. They say you can't use the stars and them to know for anything other than for three things. So they have that opinion. But there's the other opinion, and the delil is with them. The delil is with them. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he came out, and he saw that a big cloud was coming his way, and it was dark, and the people were happy because they're going to get relief from the scorching weather of Al Medina, the Arabian Peninsula. When they saw they were happy, they couldn't wait for it to come. It's a phenomenon with the Arabs. When it rains, it's party time. It makes them your iman go up. The kids go out and they play. But instead of the prophet becoming happy, he became nervous. And he said to the people, do you not remember what Allah Ta'ala did to the people of Ad? When the people of Ad saw the thing coming, they did the same thing, they got happy. But when it came, it destroyed those people. So the fact that the prophet saw the weather, the clouds, he took those signs as an indication, it's going to rain. It's going to rain. So it's permissible for us to do those things as long as we know that ultimately five things Allah knows them and only Allah. He knows when it's going to rain, what's in the stomach. So if a person goes for that thing, uh, what is it called? That's all? A scan? I thought it was a special scan. If he goes and he finds a girl or a boy, he says, okay, I'm going to have a girl or a boy. But maybe they're wrong. Will it come out? Will it reach full term? Is it in Jannah Nar? No one knows that but Allah. So concerning that, it's permissible to use our things. And I wish that we would have used that on Saturday so we'd have known what was going on with the um, rain on the day of the 8th. So on behalf of the Green Lane Masjid, I want to apologize to the community about what happened. But you can't blame the community. It started raining 10 minutes to 7, something like that. And the rain was light. By that time, everything was set up already. Everything was set up. So there are going to be people going to go to that ground because it's a drizzle. But the masjid said, the masjid said, if it rains on Saturday, we're going to go to and pray in the masjid at 7.30. As long as it rains before 7.30, we should come to the masjid. Now this is important in our deen because it goes to show what happened with the companions. And so why do the people get mad and jump up and down and just going crazy? The companions were, were with the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he told the people, no one, لا يسلين أحد من العصر إلا في بني قريضة. No one should pray Asr prayer except where Bani Qurayza the Yahud are. Pray Asr only there. So they went to go get those people and Asr time came. Asr came. They stopped. They said, hey, it's time to pray. Allah said in the Quran, Allah said we have to pray at certain times. This is Asa time we have to pray. Other people said, no, no. The Prophet said, don't pray Asa till we get over there. When you get over there, you're going to pray. They said, no, no, it's time for... And they split. Some went there and some stayed there. Some went to the aid ground, some came to the mischief. And then when the Prophet heard what happened, he didn't get on those people and he didn't get on those people because both people, you can understand what happened. You can understand what happened. So stand in the park, we understand. It rained 10 minutes to 7. The stuff is there. More, more people are going to come there. But also, the message said, if it rains. So that's the apparent statement. So the doors at least should have been open so that the people could have come into the message and they could have prayed. But I didn't like the way that some of the community dealt with the issue. It was like, you know, you know that Green Lane has a consistent pattern of being good organizers. Those volunteers from our Shabbat, the way they do things, 
uh, people have become spoiled, so they are used to the bar being raised so high that when one thing there's a, a, a glitch, one problem, then the people are spoiled. They get upset. Last question, then we're out of here, inshallah. Yeah, during the class, when we were talking about how the companions, some of them, may Allah be pleased with them, they said something that was kufr, that it rained because of this star, that star. So they made that mistake. So the point, since they were companions with the Prophet and they made mistakes, look how the Prophet dealt with them. He was gentle with them. He was easy with them. So when we see someone who raises his hands after every prayer in our local masjid, our relatives, every time raising your hands after every prayer is an innovation. It shouldn't be done. So in dealing with that, I have to take it easy. Because the companions made a bigger mistake than that. The mistake they made in this hadith was kufr. It was disbelief. Raising your hand, sometimes you can do that. Sometimes. Because one of the times your dua is accepted is after the wajib prayer. The Prophet said that. There's a delil that after the wajib prayer, it's one of the times your dua is accepted. But the Prophet didn't do it all the time like that. As a matter of fact, you won't find a hadith that he did it. He said it, but he didn't do it. His companions didn't take that hadith and do it all the time. Now I just said to you, Akhi, if a person does it sometimes, then he's following the sunnah. But to do it all the time, he's doing something that the prophet said in the wrong way. And then that's another thing that I take that position. So if I see a person with his hands up, I have to realize, okay, what kind of mistake is it? Is this a mistake like slaughtering for other than Allah? Is it a mistake like magic? Is it a No, it's a mistake where there is a delil for what he's doing. He's just doing it the wrong way. So the emphasis is take it easy and relax when we give dawah to people. So raising your hands sometimes is okay. Sometimes. But every day after every prayer, if that was the best thing to do, the prophet would have did it. His companions would have done it. He would have told the people, do this all the time. But you won't find one hadith where he did it. He said it. So it is the sunnah. But we do the sunnah the way he did. Like I mentioned, most of the time he would turn and he would face the people after prayer. Sometimes he would face this way. People on the right. It was less than this, but he would do that. And less than both of them, he would turn to the left. So what we do is, is that Jamil over there? Is that Jamil from Lithuania? Huh? Subhanallah, 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 alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Subhanallah 33 times, alhamdulillah 33 times. Allahu Akbar 34 times, not 35, 34 times. If someone does that after the wajib prayer, what's the reward? He'll get the hajj. He'll get the hajj if he does that. He'll get the hajj. He'll get the hajj. That's what he should do. Okay, Khwani, we're going to stop right here, inshallah. We'll see you guys tomorrow for the talk about the fitna. Bithinillah, Azza wa Jalla. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Subhanakallahumma.